Coming up on the program, our cabbage has failed us this summer. So we're gonna take it out and put some very quick growing squash in so we can get some before our first frost. And we've got some problems with our summer squash. We've got the squash vine or moth thing going on. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored in part by For all your non-GMO, heirloom, organic, vegetable, flowers, and herb seeds, visit dollarseed.com. Sioux Growing Supply, located in Wausau, Wisconsin, focusing on certified leaf compost, an excellent amendment for poor soil. With their new garden blend, improving soil structure in clay and sandy soil, great for creating new garden beds. Also available from Sioux, pre-filled trays and pots with professional potting soil mix or organic rice hull based potting soil mix. Bag and bulk of certified leaf compost also available. Visit SiouxGrowingSupply.com. Don't poison your soil with municipal water. Attach a body, mind, and soil hose and filter. Free shipping exclusively through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Just click on the body, mind, and soil icon. Authentic Haven brand, soil conditioner for the home gardener. Easy to brew, 100% organic. Visit ManureTea.com. Rain Reserve. Reserving your rain, preserving our future. Rain Reserve, manufacturing of rainwater capturing capabilities. Visit rainreserve.com and use coupon code RAIN2016 to save 10% on your purchase. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joy Barrett. We have a problem with our cabbage here. Now, if you followed all the program, about a month ago or so, we removed two cabbages back here that had went to seed. They were very heat sensitive, day length sensitive squash, so we removed, or uh, cabbage, so we removed those and put two eggplants in that we had extra. That's fine and dandy, we'll leave those alone. The rest of the cabbage here, we've got some purple hay cabbage that's just not forming. We've got some uh, Silveria cabbage that's just not forming. Um, we don't have the irrigation system hooked up to this one because of the fact when we hooked the irrigation system up, we were very near what we felt was going to be a, an end for the cabbage and they're going to start forming heads. That didn't happen. We have had very ex ex excessive heat, but uh, we have made the decision that we're going to rip this bed out. We can go to our local farmer's market and buy, you know, five heads of cabbages that are size of volleyballs for like a dollar and a half, two dollars, and make cold slaw or other uh, dishes like uh, similar for a very minimal amount of price for what it, we have uh, sacrificed in this bed. So what are we going to do? We're going to take and we're going to dig this bed up, take the cabbage out, put it in a compost pile, leave the eggplants alone, and we're going to put two quick growing melons in this bed. We're going to do a hybrid yellow, uh, or yellow watermelon. It takes about 68 days to reach maturity. And the reason why I'm saying fast growing is because we are approximately 80 days from our first average frost of the year. Now they determine frost, average first frost, by the previous 10 years and they average out when they occurred. Now ours is roughly about the uh, October the 10th, 11th to the 17th, somewhere in that range is typically when we have our first frost. Some of you may have it much earlier and some may have it later, never at all. But also October, we're, we're kind of gauging on October the 10th as being that frost date. Now we could have frost the 23rd of September or the 4th of November. It's just one of those toss ups. So what we're going to do here, we're going to work the bed again. We're going to hook up two drip emitters. Uh, this is the feeder tube uh, to the hills that will have them planted. Again, we're going to do a hybrid watermelon and a cantaloupe. The cantaloupe will take about 80 days to reach maturity. So we're playing that very close window there. And we'll do another trick along the way because some of the seeds we're going to plant here are very old. And I want to assure myself that we'll have something growing. So first thing I got to do is just get work in this bed, pulling this cabbage up and seeing... Uh, you know, getting the weeds out and then start building the bed for our fast-growing melons. 
Okay, so in working this bed, I found out a couple of things. This soil is extremely dense. Now, a couple of reasons for this. Prior to everything getting planted this spring, this was one of the few beds that did not get worked thoroughly as I had gone through the other beds. I, uh, for instance, this pepper bed went through with the garden fork, loosened it all up about eight inches uh, in depth, removed all the weeds and roots uh, in the bed, and, and as you can see there, virtually no weeds at all. Worked out really, really well. This bed was one that didn't have that done. This was done last year. We added some compost, some coffee grounds. Uh, you can still see the remnants of coffee grounds there. We mulched it with leaves and just let it set. Very, very dense. Now where the plants were planted, we had backfilled those with compost. So it's very loose in those areas where the cabbage and now where those eggplants are currently being grown. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna revitalize the soil the old fashioned way, not by tilling, but by naturally allowing the compost that we have to work itself into the soil and disperse, bring in the earthworms and they can literally till the soil from underneath. When in, in doing that, we can also use that compost and plant in it as well. So we're gonna have two different hills here to plant our seeds in. Now, I do have seeds soaking in Mupu tea. Again, we're 80 days out of the average first frost. I wanna get these seeds hydrated and growing as quickly as possible. Without hydrating them in Mupu tea, you're looking at uh, eight to 16, maybe 20 days in some instances of germination. And I'm just using little, little teeny tiny bags, with a little bit of mupu tea and it uh, works really well. By pre-soaking them this way, I can accelerate the germination by a third, uh, essentially. If it takes 10 days to germinate naturally, by pre-soaking mupu tea, you're looking at three to five days uh, two, two, three, five days, somewhere in that range. So keep that in mind. And I've got an extra cup of compost there in a party cup, and I'll explain what that is in a moment and why. So first of all, we're just going to divide this bed in about half here. Uh, put a big bag of compost there. We'll plateau it out and make it uh, so we can plant in it. And then one back here. Now the intentions are, by the time these uh, melons start to vine and put a lot of growth on, these eggplants will have been elevated enough to where they'll kind of grow underneath and prov provide a level of ground cover for them. This is one of the hotter areas of the garden too, so that's another benefit to growing these melons up here. So we're just going to basically, yeah, we'll just mound that a little bit there mound this here okay i'll get a chunk of dirt out of there all right now another reason why it's always done you mound the hill up for you know cantaloupe uh, melons winter squash zucchini put you know you put four or five seeds in a hill is to allow the seeds roots to begin to grow and pick up nutrients much easier than if you would just grow it dig a hole and plant it like right there. This gives the opportunity to get the seed and seedling established prior to it going into uh, the more dense soil. So what we have, I've got two types here of melons. Uh, I'm gonna heavily plant uh, both of these here. Okay. So I've got a Saskatchewan heirloom melon and then I've got the hybrid yellow uh, watermelon that we talked about. These hills are big enough, and I'm gonna plant all of these seeds, and this seems like an excessive amount. These hybrid seeds are six years old, so I have no, um, no faith that they're gonna grow at all. The Saskatchewan hybrid or heirloom melons are about three years old, so there's a little more chance that they're gonna grow. So I'm just gonna plant both of those in that hill and then in this back hill here, I've got some sugar baby watermelons. They're again about four years old. We're using old seed here. And I have some very fresh cantaloupe melon here that we're gonna plant in that uh, hill there. Now, what I've got the compost, I saved a little compost here because I'm gonna go back after I get this done and pull some more cantaloupe seeds 
and plant in here or I might even plant a um, crimp a watermelon a couple of about four or five seeds in here simply because if that pile of old watermelon seeds don't does not germinate and in a week's time they come back and nothing's grown and it should have germinated at that point then I've wasted seven days and then frost date is seven days closer so if I start everything at the same time in this cup here or there and those don't germinate then I can just transfer these seedlings over there and it's like I've lost no time at all and still have a spot that things are growing out of so it's very easy to do you just want to plant your seeds about a half inch deep uh, water them in or in this instance we're going to hook up irrigation system but I'm going to get these seeds planted and then we'll come back and we'll talk about how we're going to hook up the final connections in our irrigation system in our garden so I got them planted. I just got a little bit more poutine. You can, uh, this is a half gallon jar. You can do this from one to five gallons for one to three days. I'm just going to top water this in just to get it into the soil. And then we'll hook up our irrigation system. And that tea bag can be used about five, six more times without any issue whatsoever. Got to seed it. Okay. Now, with the irrigation system, if you've not seen our installation of Mr. Landscaper irrigation system, uh, we'll put a link in the show notes below. What we have on this half of the garden is a drip emitter system, which each you get uh, this pipe here, 100 rolls, 100 foot rolls, uh, 100 foot roll per kit, and they have little emitters on it that will produce a half gallon of water drippage at the root zone. You can see I've got it along here um, and along all the the beds here, and then on the far end we have an above ground irrigation system where it sprays. So a couple of different uh, models, a couple of different systems. They do have one strictly designed for containers as well. So this is the last portion or piece of what I have left. I've you know, maximized every square possible inch of this irrigation system. So what I've got here is I've got a drip emitter here and a drip emitter here. So what I'm going to do is I've got a vinyl tubing which runs to your emitters. This is the main feed line here. The red pipe, or the, the hose here, goes to the other system, just so I have enough, uh, enough feeder line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first hook up my vinyl tubing. And whenever you install this drip system, no tools. You need absolutely no tools. Everything's provided. You don't have to have any, anything whatsoever. Um, so we're going to punch a hole there. We're going to put in a on-off valve. And with, we have two of these drip systems, and we have one of the other system. All right, so that's the on-off valve. So with the emitter, or the drip emitter, I'm going to put it in the center. Now, as it drips a half gallon an hour, it will disperse under the soil, and these roots of the plants that grow here will pick it up and can reach for it. So I don't need to have it in this uh, s situation directly over every single seed. If I just put it dead center, uh, it will be fine. So I need, uh, with what v pieces we had left between the two systems, I have another on-off valve here just because it's a, a coupler or a connector. It uh, works just the same. I right, got my last on-off valve. Again, if you were doing this with the normal kit, you would just need the coupling, couplers. Since it's the end of the end, I'm utilizing all additional extra pieces that was left over after I put the system in. That's why it is appearing in this... Uh, in this way with an on-off valve, on-off valve, on-off valve. Now I can just take a chunk of dirt if I choose to, put right there. That drip emitter is in the center of that pile. That drip emitter is in the center of that pile. I've got the eggplants here which are not on any drip system, but they'll be okay. So we took the cabbage out. The bed was much denser in soil compaction than I anticipated. So we went ahead and went with the piles of compost planted in those piles of compost and as it rains as we water that compost will work itself into the soil and naturally loosen the soil up as, and encouraging and bringing in worms to help do that tillage for us over the duration of this year and into next year and we'll have some melons here because we're going to have water directly to them as we have over on our straw, straw bale garden uh, over on the other side of the garden and that's the key here with these melons you got to keep the water to them otherwise they're going to not produce so taking one failure turning into a success story here
and the intentions that we get this growing with a small amount of time we have left before our average first frost date. So we planted these beets a little over two months ago about that and now they're ready to harvest. We just put them in this 60 gallon grow bag with uh, some good soil from Sioux compost and we've we've harvested a couple but now we want to get a second planting so we're just going to go ahead and pull out the rest and as you can see that's just a nice happy beet. There is some splitting on there but that's okay it happens. We introduced the irrigation a couple weeks ago and that's really helped uh, progress the growth of the beets. So we got a couple here to harvest and they're I think these are probably some of the largest beets we've grown and we're really pleased with how they've come out. So after we get these beets pulled out we're going to go ahead we're going to revitalize the soil with more compost and some fertilizer. Now it's not recommended typically to take your crop and put another crop the same crop on top of it but since we're going to revitalize it and add the fertilizer we feel it's fine in the situation and since beets grow uh, fairly quickly it'll be okay and like I said this is probably the, one of the nicest harvests we've had and um, I think that's due to the fact that we have the irrigation um, we've had this nice really loose soil that they're growing in and just uh, some happy beet seeds happy beet growth all the way around all right Holly just harvested the beets out of her 60 gallon grow bag from root, uh, root maker it's her, and now I'm going to revitalize the soil and we're going to plant more beets again like she illustrated it's not recommended to go back to back on crops but this is literally the only spot I have available and I want to get another harvest of, of beets out of it we did very well with this so we're going to revitalize the soil now we've got good certified leaf compost in here and we didn't fill these up all the way these are 15 inches high there's no need for vegetables to be planted in something that deep these are actually designed for tree root development and we've brought them into the edible garden world it's worked really well so first of all I'm going to take some more compost here there's a couple of hand uh, shovelfuls now I do have an irrigation system I'm going to rework in here all right now the beets didn't suck all the nutrients out of the soil here but we are adding some more back in here and the recommended application rate for some 464 sustained fertilizer and I'll take a little cultivator and I'll work this all in to the grow bed or the grow bag here we'll rewrap the irrigation drip system in and I'll plant the beets just like it did before about uh, three to four inch centers and that's how easy it is to pull harvest and replant in the same area and revitalizing the soil so you can get more out of one spot we're in a front yard raised bed garden and we've got summer squash here we've got black zucchini and yellow crookneck and as you can see with this one here it looks like it needs water but we've got a drip system in and they don't need water and you can see by remnants of what looks like little sawdust here we've got the squash vine moth has laid its larva and the larva has begun to overtake our squash and now you can do a couple of things here I'll, we're going to extract them and see if we can uh, help the plant along if they're too far gone this is more this is very prevalent on um, summer squash pumpkins zucchini in this instance and um, other winter squashes you'll get this so if here I'm, I'm going to rip this plant out because it's I've got one here that's not effective and we'll take a look and examine what we have here we've got a good root development of the squash because of the loose soil look at the roots there, of the good soil and the moisture but you can see what it appears to be what looks to be like sawdust there if we go a little further into the operation of digging it out there is the larva that is eating the inner portions of the vine and killing it off that's why it looks like uh, you may have it just needs water but what's happening is you it's too far past the stage of recovery 
because the larva, this instance, when we only have one, sometimes you have five, seven, eight, nine of them that you have to dig out. Now, if this was a large plant, I could just do an incision, cut down the stalk, open it up, and then pull out all of these worms or this larva, and then put compost back over top of it to allow it to kind of scab over. With this here, there's no save in it. Uh, we'll squash it and uh, look at, see what other things we've got going on here. Now, one way you can at least decrease your chances of, of having this occur in your garden is plant a later crop of summer squash at the end of July when a lot of the birthing or the mating or the laying of the larva has already occurred. Now at the time of planting we could have netted this with a very thick netting of, uh, of mesh and then it, when they start flowering then we could open up the net and uh, allow the bees to pollinate these plants. But something that you need to be aware of, it happens very, uh, very often in a lot of different areas. So I'm going to go in here and try to dig out that larva. I see one there is a problem. Them two look pretty safe. Now, butternut squash is a winter squash that is not affected by the squash vine board because of the denseness of the stem. So if you're having problems, that might be a, a variety that you want to go with there. So do your research in your area and hopefully it doesn't happen to you or if you do, you are able to see the early signs of it like we have here and are able to at least slow down, prevent it, remove them and allow your plants to grow for the rest of the summer. Thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for more organic gardening and food preserving. I'm Joy Barrett and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.